Welcome to The Real Mr. Beer, Mr. Beer's own channel. We're here to provide you home brewing guidance and tips, equipping you with all sorts of beer knowledge. My name is Tim Falk, I'm the customer service manager here at Mr. Beer. Today we're doing something kind of special. We are doing a recipe that actually hasn't been released yet, that I just did um, about a month ago. You guys saw me bottle it. It's a uh, tart boysenberry saison. Uh, it's going to be called Dead and Buried. Um, it has zero stars because it's not even up on the website yet, like I said. So we're going to brew that and we're going to talk about how I picked the ingredients. And we're also going to talk a little bit about how to brew in the summer when the temperature gets warm. So about my new beer, it's got an ABV of 5.1%. ABV stands for alcohol by volume. That tells you how much alcohol is in the beer. Um, it has an SRM3, which is... Uh, color or darkness of the beer. SRM stands for Standard Reference Method. It's on a scale of 1 to 40, so 3 is definitely on the light side. Um, like we've discussed before, uh, beers that have a lot of extract in them, like our system, tend to turn out a little dark for the style because of the process for manufacturing the extract. So for darker beers like stouts, porters, browns, ambers, it's not really a big deal. But if you're trying to make a really light beer, like um, certain kinds of Saison, um, it might turn out a little bit darker. So it is plausible you'll come up with an SRM of a little bit more than three. Won't taste any different, might just turn out a little bit darker. Um, it's going to have 33 IBUs. IBU stands for International Bitterness Units, so the IBUs tells you how bitter your beer is. It's on a scale of 1 to 100, so 33 is definitely on the less bitter side. Um, we're going to do a 10 minute hot boil, which is pretty short. That's just going to be for some aroma. And we're going to do it with Hollertau hops, um, which have pretty low alpha acids. So this isn't really contributing much uh, bitterness. It's probably not going to contribute any bitterness at all. Um, this is a great beer for fans of Saisons in general, fruit beers in general. Um, Wayward Brewing, Peculiar Brewing, and Fat Bottom Brewing all do their own uh, boysenberry Saisons. Um, mine is a tart boysenberry saison, meaning it has uh, lactic acid in it. We'll get to that in a minute. So this recipe is going to include one can of Grand Bohemian Czech Pilsner. I got that uh, in some hot water right now to loosen up the extract. It's real thick, kind of like molasses. Comes with a golden LME. That's our wheat LME. I put that in there for some haziness. Um, so I picked the Pilsner because it's on the pale side. It's not very bitter. It's pretty neutral, so it'll really let the, the boysenberry and the yeast esters from the Saison yeast stand out. Um, I picked the golden LME to add to it, the wheat LME, to add a bit of haziness. Saison's, as we discussed in weeks past, is a farmhouse style. That means it does not have to be uh, perfectly crystal clear and in fact I find that an unfiltered look to it kind of makes it seem more rustic I guess you could say uh, which is a desirable uh, quality to a saison. Um, so it also includes a packet of Hallertau hops which we are like I said we're going to do a 10 minute boil. Uh, like we've discussed before, when you're boiling hops, you don't want to do it in just water. Um, we'll get to that when we actually brew, though. I picked Hallertau hops because they're very mild, kind of noble. Um, they're not going to overwhelm the blueberry, or rather the boysenberry, oh my gosh. And um, it's going to complement the spicy, kind of funky esters we get with the um, Saison yeast. But I wanted to do a hot boil because if I didn't, this would be a super malty recipe. And it's okay for a Saison to be on the malty side, but I wanted this to be a little bit more well-balanced. Um, beers that have tartness in them, generally, in my experience, don't really have overwhelming bitterness. Um, that will be true here as well. Uh, you're gonna get two hop sacks. One of them is gonna be for your steep slash mash, which is what we're doing right now. Um, so, uh, the, this has four ounces of Pilsen malt and four ounces of Vienna. I chose Pilsen because that's typically the base malt for Saison recipes. And I chose Vienna to give it a little bit of maltiness. Uh, Vienna is kind of like a slightly lighter version of Munich. They're very, very similar. 
Um, you're gonna have one can of boysenberries, uh, which I have right here just as a visual aid. These are not gonna get added until a week before you bottle. Like I mentioned in our fruit beer episode, when you use your fruit as a late addition, it retains more flavor, aroma, and just a touch of sweetness, which is not desirable in a Saison at all. It's gonna be really dry finishing, but uh, I didn't find it was overwhelmingly sweet, and I found that it was kind of balanced by the tartness, which is given to us by the lactic acid. Now, when you have a sour beer that is brewed by a brewery, Probably they soured it um, with actual bacteria or wild yeast. Um, often it will be with a lactobacillus. Now, a lactobacillus is a kind of bacteria that um, is found in many food products like sourdough bread and yogurt. Um, now, whereas yeast will consume sugar and ferment it into carbon dioxide and alcohol, lactobacillus will ferment it into lactic acid. This stuff, that sour stuff, the lactic acid is what the lactobacillus produces that gives these foods and beverages their sour taste. So, in a sense, it's kind of cheating. Um, like Josh brought up when um, I was bottling this recipe and kind of talking about how it came about, um, there are some disadvantages to lactic acid. Primarily, it doesn't have as complex of a flavor compared to uh, using an actual lactobacillus. Now, there are some lactobacillus that only produce lactic acid, but also there are lactobacillus that produce other acids and, um, gosh, what is the word? It's totally escaping me, but other alcohols. Um, so the point is, there is more flavor than just the lactic acid when you're using some kind of lactobacillus, when you're using the real bacteria. The advantages, though, is that this is much faster um, there is no risk of off flavors, which, whereas there is a relatively high risk of off flavors using the actual bacteria. Um, so, we're taking kind of a shortcut with the tartness because I'm willing to sacrifice a little bit of the complexity in exchange for having it be real simple. Uh, this is going to get added at the same time as your boysenberries, which is, like I said, one week before, I, before you bought it. So, um, first what I did before we started uh, streaming today, I went and I put my malt extracts in some hot water. Like I said, it has a real thick consistency. It'll come out more easily this way. I also started my steep slash mash. Now, the difference between those, the purpose of a mash is to create fermentable sugars. The purpose of a steep is to lend flavor, color, and aroma. Now, you get flavor, color, and aroma when you mash. You don't get fermentable sugars when you steep. The difference is temperature. Um, off the top of my head, if I am remembering right, and I'm sure I will be corrected if I'm not, mashing has to be above 155 degrees Fahrenheit. Under that, it's going to be a steep, so you're still going to get flavor, aroma, and color out of it. Uh, you're not going to want to steep any flaked adjuncts because they'll leave behind starches, complex sugar, that yeast can't ferment into alcohol, which can cause infections. But uh, when you're just using regular malted barley like we are today, you don't really have to worry about that and you can steep it and it'll turn out just fine. Um, when I'm doing a steep, I start with six cups of water instead of the regular four because the grains need to be covered for this to work. I added an additional cup of water as the mash went on because it started, um, the bag started uh, to protrude over the water and as you can see it's starting to again. Uh, the grains absorb a lot of water. So since we're getting close to the end of the mash I'm not going to worry too much about it. If it was going to go much further I'd probably add one more cup of water just to completely submerge them. But I'm pretty happy with what I've gotten out of it. Um, so that's what we've done so far. So now we're going to sanitize our equipment. Just to switch things up a little bit today, I'm going to use one of our Brumax fermenters. This is our Brumax 2G fermenter. As you can see, it has a different uh, spigot design. This one just slides in and out. There's no um, nut. There's nothing to screw on. And uh, it opens and closes like that. Uh, as you can see, it has a much bigger lid. It also has what's called a Krausen collar. Uh, this part is optional. But um, if you have a beer that you expect to have a lot of Krausen, which as you guys probably know refers to the foam that your fermentation is going to produce, um, this will help prevent overflow because it will rise a little bit. 
Um, it comes with clips that you can use to clip it on so it rises properly. Um, I usually don't bother with the Krausen collar. I kind of just wanted to show you guys what it was about. Uh, the big advantage to um, to these Brumax fermenters is that they are a lot easier to care for. They're easier to clean. Um, they're dishwasher safe. That part's kind of nice. And um, I guess disadvantage is it's clear, so you have to keep it out of sunlight a little more carefully than you would with an LBK. Um, but other than that, I've been quite happy with the results I've gotten from these. Uh, we'll go into some other reasons an LBK can have some advantages when it comes to temperature control here in a minute. But just like when we're using an LBK for any recipe or refill, the first thing we're going to do is sanitize our equipment. The reason we do this is that beer is a very attractive environment for bacteria, mold, and wild yeast. Like we were just talking about, every now and again you'll get a beer like a wild ale or a sour beer where uh, those are introduced intentionally, but if you get it growing in the wrong kind of beer, the flavor won't complement the base beer well, if that makes sense. So, since we are making a beer that's tart with lactic acid and not with actual bacteria, we're going to sanitize our equipment real well to make sure that none of that stuff grows in our beer and causes off -break. So we're going to fill our fermenter with a gallon of water and we're going to add in half this packet of no rinse cleanser. The other half is going to get saved for bottling day. Um, the easiest thing to remember is just that if it's going to touch the beer, it needs to be sanitized. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take a shortcut and sanitize the rest of my equipment with Star Sand, which is another kind of sanitizer. If you look around online, it's easy to find that there are any number of sanitizing products, but the Nomad's Cleanser is the one that's included in the cost of your refills and recipes. So I say why not use that one? As you can see, um, the lid is not airtight. That is on purpose. Um, that is to allow carbon dioxide to escape the fermenter, but the force of the carbon dioxide leaving the fermenter is enough to push out all that bad stuff that we're trying to keep out, as well as um, oxygen, which can cause off flavors. So now our fermenter is well fermented. Oh my gosh, our fermenter is sanitized. <laughs> It's one of those days, guys. And then here's our star sand to sanitize our utensils. I'm just resting them on the sanitized lid so I don't put them on the totally not sanitized table. and or steep is done we are just gonna oops, I almost forgot my water. Um, we're just gonna run a cup of water over our grain sack it's kind of a mini sparge sparging in all grain brewing refers to running water over your grains to increase your brew house efficiency or make sure you're not leaving behind too many fermentable sugars. That's not really a huge issue for us because the bulk of our fermentables are coming from our extract. We're just doing this mash for color, flavor, and aroma. So I'm not going to lose any sleep if I don't get every drop of fermentables out of this that I could. So while I'm doing that, I'm going to start my water boiling for my 10 minute hot boil and while that gets going I'm gonna talk to you guys about summer brewing so as you are all no doubt aware by now um, temperature control is very important if you want your beer to turn out well in the summer this can become very challenging especially if you're like us you live in a place like Tucson that's 108 degrees crazy electric bills every month just trying to keep your house livable it can be a nightmare and when you throw brewing in there it just gets even more complicated so there are a few ways 
that you can control your fermentation temperature. The first would be to make what you can think of as an improvised evaporative cooler, swamp cooler. All this means is that you're going to put your fermenter in a pan with about two inches of water and then you're going to cover it with a wet towel or a wet t-shirt or something like that. What that's going to do, um, the water evaporating out of the towel and out of the, um, out of the pan is going to reduce the temperature about 10 to 15 degrees from the ambient temperature in the room. Um, you'll want to bear in mind that fermentation produces a little bit of heat, so um, you'll want to count on your beer or your wort being a few degrees warmer than the room it's in. Um, the advantages to improvising a swamp cooler is that it's dirt cheap and pretty much everyone has a pan and a towel laying around the house, so you're probably not going to need to buy any equipment. The bad news is it is not super reliable. Um, I mean, if it gets hot enough, it's not going to make enough of a difference probably. If your house is in the 90s or something, I don't think that's going to do the job. Um, and you will have to change out the water and the towel quite a bit because it's going to dry out quick depending on where you live. Um, your second option is a little bit more reliable. For that, you can just get yourself a picnic cooler. Um, and you can put your fermenter in there with a few ice packs or frozen water bottles, something like that and change them out every 12 hours or so. Now, the advantage to that is um, it's more reliable because it's better insulated than just that swamp cooler method. Um, however, a couple problems. Um, the LBK is probably the only fermenter you're going to be able to find a uh, cooler big enough to fit into. Um, as you can see, this is pretty tall, it's not really going to fit, and if you're doing a 6 gallon or one of these uh, fast ferments back here, it's just not going to happen. So your choice of equipment you can use is a bit limited in terms of fermenter and batch size, but uh, the investment for the equipment is still pretty minimal. Um, you know, you can get pickup coolers for like 10 bucks. Um, there is a third option that is a little bit more of an investment, but it is hands down the most effective. Um, it is called a digital temperature controller. It looks like this. So it's got a few parts. It plugs into the wall like any other electronic. Um, this is the display. It will have a low end temperature and a high end temperature that you set. You'll set a range, I usually do about five degrees. Um, and you plug a refrigerator into this part right here. Now the size of the fridge is gonna be uh, determined by what kind of fermenter you plan on using. You know, if you're gonna be doing a fast ferment or something like that, I would use a full size fridge. But if you're just using an LBK or one of the 2G Brewmaxes, there's really no reason you couldn't just use a mini fridge. Um, and then, this part over here is the temperature probe. You would put this in the fridge. I would put it in a cup of water because um, water holds its temperature much, much, much better than air. So um, if you just have that probe floating around in there all willy-nilly, um, you can get kind of inaccurate readings that make it kick on and shut off a lot. Um, right now I'm adding in my hops for my hot boil. It's pretty, it smells good too. Mm -hmm. um, so you guys will notice that I am not boiling my hops in just water. I did my mash first. Um, the reason that you can't boil hops in just water is that the oils in the hops, the molecules need something to kind of stick to, which the fermentable sugars in the malt are giving it. Um, if you boiled it in water, you can get a grassy off flavor, so don't do that. Um, if your house is about 80 in the summer, what yeast could I use without additional cooling? That is a great question, and I was just getting to that point. Um, your fourth option, if you um, just want to chuck this whole temp control thing out the window and you just have a warm house, 
that you want to ferment in in the open air and not deal with it. Um, like Josh is saying, you can use a Saison yeast. You can also use a wheat yeast. Those are two strains that tolerate high temperatures very well. That's the good news. The bad news is they both generate really unique flavors that are really going to limit the style of beer you can make. You wouldn't use a Saison yeast with a stout. That wouldn't taste very good. Um, like he says, there are also some Belgian yeasts that have a higher temperature tolerance. So the good news is there are yeasts that you can ferment very warm. The bad news is they create such distinctive flavors from their esters that um, it is not always easy to pair them with a base. Like Josh is saying, the wheat yeast will give you banana esters at um, warm temperatures. The Saison yeast will give you kind of funky or spicy flavors. And uh, Belgian yeast will give off some kind of bubblegum flavors, which sounds really weird, but depending on the style, it can be really good. So you're just going to have to be kind of creative if you do this. For example, if you want an IPA, but your house is 80 degrees, consider doing a um, Belgian IPA. Um, if you want to do a pail, consider turning it into a Saison. It's quite easy. I have trouble pronouncing the word that Joss just put into the stream. I think it's Kvak, if I'm remembering right, something like that. Please forgive me if I'm wrong. It might be Quake. Quake, something like that, yeah. But it's a Norwegian yeast, Norwegian farmhouse strain that has very high temperature tolerance without esters, which is really cool. Pronounced Queek. I was pretty right. Pretty close. Not pretty right. I was right. Um, we got about six minutes left in our hot boil. Um, we have a chart on our hop blog that illustrates that the effect you get from your hops uh, is dependent on how long you boil them. Um, if you were going to try and get bitterness out of your hops, you would want to boil them for about 30 to 60 minutes. If you were looking to get just flavor out of them, you'd want to do more like 10 to 20. And if you wanted just aroma out of them, you'd be doing 10 or less. Another thing you're going to want to keep in mind is you do not want to boil our canned extracts. The reason is it already has the bittering hops done. We do that part for you. Saves you a lot of time, space, and equipment. Um, but if you boil that stuff, you can get grassy off flavors. So if you're going to do a hot boil, you either do it in the grain water from your mash or you do it in your LME. Um, since I had mash water, I didn't bother with the LME because I didn't want to um, run the risk of caramelizing any sugars. Uh, if you brew Canadian Blondes or Pilsners and light beers, you probably want to think about turning them into Saisons would be my suggestion. However, if you've never had a Saison, I would highly, highly suggest that you go pick one up before you spend a bunch of money on refills and Saison yeast. They have a very distinctive, unique flavor. It's actually kind of hard to describe because it's very complex. Um, it's kind of funky, kind of spicy, and it really depends on what you get. Saison, as we discussed in the Saison episode, is a very broad style. Um, like Josh is saying, if you were trying to make a true Canadian blonde or a true Pilsner, a Saison yeast would not work at all. However, if you wanted to just make a pale Saison style beer and use our Grand Bohemian Czech Pilsner or our Canadian Blonde as a base, that is absolutely an option. So that's what I meant when I said you kind of got to be creative. We don't sell a refill that's just a can that says Saison. So you're going to kind of have to think a little creatively and do a little research, maybe call us and ask a few questions uh, to develop a recipe that's going to work well. Um, but just because you're limited to a few strains of yeast doesn't mean you need to get bored. You can make radically different beers with those styles of yeast. You can use a wheat yeast to make a Dunkelweiss, um, a Hefeweizen, you could do a Vit beer, um, Saisons and Beer de Gardes. Um, you can find these beers with traditional noble hops. You can find them with New World American IPA kind of hops like Citra. You can do them with fruit, 
like we did talked about in my fruit beer episode. You can do them with spices like Josh talked about in his spiced beer episode. Don't let yourself get bored just because some of your ingredients are restricted. That doesn't mean that the rest of them are. Um, so our hot boil is going to be done here in a couple minutes. Alright. Let's see if there's any questions. Not really. Um, if you're going to be brewing a lot, I would highly, highly recommend making the investment in the digital temperature controller. I would also add that these are really the only way you're going to be able to brew at lighter temperatures. I've had some brewers say they can get to the 50s with, um, with just coolers and ice packs, but I'm kind of skeptical. I'm thinking maybe those dudes are living in Wisconsin or something, and they're just kind of, you know, talking themselves up a little bit. You know how you Wisconsinians are. Um, our hot boil is just about done. Last Thursday's episode was a farmhouse episode. Farmhouse ales are a really cool style. Um, it's kind of interesting to me because it really represents more kind of a brewing philosophy than actual style per se. Yeah, Wednesday. Um, and Saisons are only one relatively small um, subset of farmhouse ales. It's a very, very broad style. It just has to be kind of funky, usually kind of tart. Um, gosh, I don't remember the whole definition off the kind of my head. There's a whole episode about it, like Josh said, from last week, and it was excellent, as all of them are. All right. I'm willing to call that 10 minutes. Um, I'm not trying to be super exact here. I just wanted, like I said, the holler towel. Just a little bit of really mild noble hop flavor to kind of counteract all the Vienna malts I put in there, all the pills and the LME. That's going to make your beer much more on the malty side of the malty hoppy spectrum. And I want this to be a well-balanced beer. So I am going to go ahead and get my cold water. The reason I am using refrigerated water rather than room temperature is because I want my wort to be around 65 degrees when I pitch my yeast. The reason is if it's too much warmer, you can get off flavors. Like we were just talking about, Saison yeast tends to have a higher temperature tolerance. It tends to be a little more forgiving, um, but all the same, uh, if you want to get those esters from your Saison yeast, just ferment it at a warm temperature. Don't try and pitch it warm. Um, all right, so kind of nice not needing a funnel with the uh, 2G as well. So I'm just going to go ahead and pour in my one gallon of cold water. I also use filtered water. Um, the reason I don't use tap is because tap water tends to be chlorinated and chlorine can interact with yeast in such a way that it creates a plasticky off flavor. It tastes kind of like band-aids or cough syrup uh, caused by a chemical called chlorophenols. I don't want my beer to taste like band-aids, so I use filtered instead. The reason I don't use distilled water is that distilled water is entirely devoid of minerals, but yeast are just like us in the sense that they need minerals to survive. So um, I use filtered. If you have spring water, that's good to use too. Um, the bottom line up front though is if your water tastes good to drink, it's going to be good to brew with. So I filled up the fermenter at first to the four quart line, actually four liters. Is it, does it have quarts and liters? I don't, it doesn't matter because a quart is a liter. It's pretty much the same thing. Um, we filter our water. We have a built-in filter over here in our sink. Uh, you can buy filtered water at the store. Like I said, spring water is just fine. Rule of thumb is if it's good to drink, it's going to make good beer. I know my beer is kind of green looking right now. That's just because of all the hot particles floating around in there. Those are going to settle out as the beer ferments. I'm filling it up now to the 8.5 liter mark. 
we're gonna assume we're gonna lose about half a liter to uh, the sediment, and that's fine. So you're gonna end up with about two gallons of beer. All right, there we go. Now I am gonna whisk my wort, which is called aerating it. Yeast are also like us in the sense that they need oxygen to survive. A bit of filter pitcher is just fine. I believe the filter on our sink uses a similar mechanism. As you can see, it's a little bit easier to aerate the work when you have a little more space. So, now that that is done, I'm going to pitch my yeast. Pitching just means adding it to your work. As you might have picked up, brewers love their fancy vocab words to make simple processes sound much more complicated than they actually are, but I just pitched the yeast, there we are. And then I'm going to close my fermenter. Alright, so we're going to want to keep this beer between 63 and 85 degrees Fahrenheit. So as you can see, very forgiving. Um, you're going to want to keep it out of direct sunlight. Contrary to popular belief, ultraviolet light is what skunks beer, not heat. Um, ultraviolet light, of course, being the kind of light that the sun puts out. Um, after about 24 hours, you're probably going to see some activity in your uh, fermenter. If you have older yeast, it might be a little bit delayed, or if it's on the cooler side of the fermentation scale, unlikely since it's mid-June. Um, Let's see. So you're typically going to see foam, especially with a Saison yeast that's real hungry or real high attenuator. Attenuation, of course, refers to how much of the available fermentable sugar the yeast is going to eat up. If a yeast is a low attenuator, that means it's going to leave a lot of residual sugar and be on the sweet side. This is a high attenuator, meaning it's going to leave next to no residual sugar and be on the dry side. Um, at any rate, a common question I get, especially from new brewers, is, hey Tim, I don't see any foam in my fermenter. Does that mean my beer isn't fermenting? The answer is no. Um, the foam is not a very good indication of fermenting. What you will see, though, is a layer of sediment collecting at the bottom of your fermenter. That stuff is called trube. It's made of spent yeast and malt particles. Um, a lot of times you'll also see, like someone said, they don't have any foam, but there will be like a big brown ring around their fermenter and just no active foam. If there's a ring that's like up to here, that means that um, the Krausen already crested and went back down. High Krausen refers to the point where the foam gets the highest. Um, after about five days, probably the activity will start to die off, but just because you don't see anything happening doesn't mean nothing is happening. Your beer's still fermenting. After two weeks, you're going to add your pureed boysenberries and your lactic acid. There's no need to stir. Um, water has no nutrients, but it does have minerals like Josh was saying. Okay, very good. Um, and then you're going to give it another week in the fermenter after you add your lactic acid and your blueberries. I would highly, highly, highly recommend cold crashing any beer that's got fruit in it because it has a lot of sediment. Um, so cold crashing refers to putting your fermenter in the fridge for uh, about two days. If you have this handy dandy temperature controller, you can just turn it down to 36. If not, just put it in the fridge. Um, and then you bottle two days later. You're going to ferment for three weeks total. Um, and for a Saison, whenever I'm doing a Saison, I always brew it on the warmer end of the temperature scale, even if it's not summer because I kind of feel like the whole point of making a Saison is to get those funky spicy esters. If you're going to brew it on the cold end and have it come out kind of clean finishing, why not just use nail yeast? Um, that's just my two cents. So I'm going to give it a second to see if you guys have any more questions. Um, like Josh says, uh, minerals and nutrients aren't the same thing. Uh, but a Brita filter or any other filter should leave enough nutrients for the yeast to live off. If you were going to use distilled water, which some more advanced brewers do, you kind of have to build your own water profile, which is absolutely a thing that brewers do. But since this is the beginner intermediate stream, I'm going to assume you guys are not doing that and you're just going to use water from whatever source you got. You guys don't have very many questions by the end of the show. I guess you get them all out during the show. 
Well, thank you guys so much for joining me. It was great going over my new recipe with you. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did here at the office. Um, please tune in tomorrow for Josh's advanced stream. And I will see you guys next week. Thanks again. Thank you.